Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitars, and I am with today my brother of the leaf. And that, <laughs> just to qualify, leaf as in Arturo Fuente cigars, not leaf as in Black Sabbath sweet leaf weed. Although maybe we haven't discussed that, but that's another conversation that's true, yeah. for another day. <laughs> right. Anyway, I'm here with really cool Jeff Heim. Jeff owns Heim Amplification out of Nashville, Tennessee. Heim Amplification does amplifier repairs, mods, and custom rebuilds. Uh, founded in 2012, Heim Amplification is working with 18 years of electronic industry experience. Jeff started playing guitar at an early age and attended Belmont University, and he got a degree in classical guitar, which means you're very disciplined and very smart. I did not say that. Ah, it's true, man. That's that You went off script on that one. I did, but it's true. <laughs> After college, Jeff became interested in electronics, and he gained valuable experience for 11 years working for one of, I hate that when my New York accent come out, I said 11 years, 11 years <laughs> working for one of Nashville's top repair shops. In his spare time, Jeff honed his craft by building and modifying amplifiers and pedals. Heim Amplification provides quality parts and top-notch repair services for musical instruments. He's got great customer support and prices that are hard to beat. And because of their commitment, experience, and expertise, Heim Amplification has established a business relationship with many of Nashville's top players, which I know this to be very true. And by the way, it's Heim, H-I-M-E, Amplification. Some interesting stuff about Jeff. MTV was his main babysitter. That's a little disturbing. Uh, <laughs> In punk bands, he couldn't afford a good amp, so he had to start building them, which is really cool. He got into electronics because of his uh, job out of college. He once wired up Bob Dylan's pedal wrong, which we'll have to talk about that. He takes too long with projects, which I think he's probably being hard on himself. He remembers the first time he heard a real Marshall. He heard angels sing, and he loves <laughs> chaos. With that in mind, Jeff, thanks so much for coming on the show. You're an awesome guy. Thank you so much for having me on. Brother of the Leaf, I love that. Brother of the Leaf, yes. So we could just talk about cigars the whole time. <laughs> 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 Today's episode has nothing to do with music or guitar. Right, uh, yes. So let's start off with the Bob Dylan pedal story first, because that sounds pretty interesting. What was the deal with uh, that? I shouldn't even have mentioned that, because that was super embarrassing. That was, that was the worst. Uh, I had just started at uh, the old shop, and this was years ago. Uh, I hate disclaimer decades ago. <laughs> and so uh, there was a guy, um, his name was uh, uh, Bennett. Um, actually, uh, there's a guy that uh, this is not to get over on a sidetrack, but his father is uh, Johnny, Johnny Bennett, I think, the guy that is credited with uh, starting rockabilly music. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, That's interesting. Uh, Burn, burn. Uh, anyway, uh, so anyway, though this guy, he was going off to do a gig with Bob Dylan, and he had this little like switcher pedal, and um, they gave it to me, and the boss had left, and all this, and he was like, just wire up the input jack, and then you should be fine, and then you know, hand it to him, he'll be over in a minute. I accidentally wired up the little switchcraft jack wrong. Oh, I did it wow. backwards. And so anyway, though, we get this call from L.A., you know, how could you do this and all this stuff? And like, you know, the guy cussed me out on that, which he had total, you know, I, I was like, yeah, you know, you're right. I shouldn't have done that. But uh, that's whenever I learned really fast. Anything you fix, you test. Otherwise, you did uh, not fix it. A great lesson. I mean, it's unfortunate yes. you got to learn it on Bob Dylan. But, you know, hey, it's just, you got to learn it on somebody, you know. Yeah. And I mean, you know what? I think that I was so nervous. I think I would have messed that up anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, I can't blame you, you know, but you got to look at it being objective. If you're Bob Dylan, I mean, you've probably had, you know, a thousand, you know, 500 mods. I mean, statistically, you're due for a bad one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? And it's, uh, it's just I had then. just started. I didn't I just didn't know what I was doing. And so I uh, I didn't test it. And that was a deal and it's like I, from now on I, I say to anybody that works with me or for me or whatever it's if you didn't test it you didn't fix it yeah. and that's the deal that's I mean, a great lesson actually 
Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, when I go and pick up my motorcycle at the chop shop or whatever, the, um, uh, you know, I the first thing I ask, did you ride it? And, you know, of course they're going to say yes or yeah. whatever. But you have to test everything, especially in electronics. And that's why I'm so super maniacal about that. It's just, it has to be tested. And yeah. so All the- I don't even... I, honestly, I don't even think of myself much as an engineer as I do a guitar player that builds and modifies amps. Does that make sense? No, it to- makes total sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't uh, – in a like a friend of mine, he brought over – he wanted to – his favorite pedal is the – and I know I'm getting a little bit off track, but – the, a friend of mine has he loves the rat pedal mm. who doesn't right but um he was like i, I want to change this rat pedal i want it to be this way and so we got together and it took me like 20 minutes because there's nothing to it but he played i changed it for him and um he loved what we came up with and so then he takes it to his friend to have it manufactured and all this stuff and the guy was like there's like four or five things in here that are not uh electronically that don't make sense electronically. And it's like, I could care less. Yeah. Who yeah. gives a shit about right. any of that? It sounds good. It sounds the way he wanted it to sound. So it's like, I don't ever take any of that stuff into account. As long as it's safe. Yeah. Sound is all what it, it's got to feel good. And it's got to be, you know, it's got to have that thing to it. And so, so yeah, the safety thing is obviously important, but yeah, Absolutely. Right, but I I really don't even care about that that much. So, <laughs> <laughs> that that's just a, a minor thing. No, that's um, why you're a guitar player. That's an amp guy. As a, exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, everybody over the years, and this has been a long time, and I can even still remember this as a kid playing in like really crappy bands. People would always say to me, "Man, this sounded so good right before it blew up," and. <laughs> That's the deal. I mean, that's why an AC-30 sounds so good, because it's on the edge of failing. And so there's something to be said right there. I mean, it's just if you can sustain that kind of like, you know, edge of destruction, you've got something magical. You know what? I'm going to write that down because I want to come back and talk about that when in a few few minutes, because that is really relevant to a couple of questions away. The Edge of Destruction. I like that. That would be a great yeah. name for an amp line. This is our Edge of Destruction model. Right, yeah. yeah I like I, that. I may do that. I may come up with an amp that only will uh, you can only play for like 20 minutes. <laughs> and then, <laughs> then smoke comes out. <laughs> I interviewed uh, Greg Martin, who is the guitar player from the Kentucky Headhunters. And uh, he said to I we were talking about Warren Haynes. We both like Warren. He knows Warren. He goes, oh, yeah, I blew up his amp once. It lasted like 20 minutes. <laughs> I blew it up. There was smoke yeah. coming out of it. So, you know, this is not that, unco- not that uncommon. Right. Hey, you do a lot of different things at High amp- Amplification. What do you seem to spend most of your time working on? And what do you actually like doing the most? So the two congruent or? Yeah, I thought about. You know, what I really love to do is what got me into this whole, like, this madness is when I first started working on amps, there was a guy, my teacher, um, he, what fascinates me is taking a boat anchor, just the worst amp you've ever heard in your life, and then making it magical. Just making it like get in your fingers and you feel the butter and you mm-hmm. – uh, one of those amps where it's like I can't even think of all the licks I want to play with this. You, you know what I mean? Like whenever you can take something and just change a few things and then all of a sudden it's just like, oh, what is this? What is this thing? What is this entity that's just changed everything? And – um you know, if they've got the budget for it, I'll go to town. I'll just like, you know, what well, I compare amps because, like, you know, you have a guitar, and this to me is the only instrument where this happens. A guitar, when you play electric guitar, you have two instruments. You have an amp, and then you got the guitar. Yeah, that's very and, true. And that, I mean, you know, bass players don't really have that. They they just want, you know, just big 
clean. They want it under their fingers, and that's about it. Sure. And that's fine. But when it comes to guitar, it's like you're playing an amp. You're playing a guitar. You're playing everything like that. And so what um, – I kind of lost my – way but it's a it's really you know that 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 thing you it's is it controlling you are you controlling it are you playing along it's like it's weird it sort of like taps into this weird part of your subconscious i guess and um as a player it's it's magic so you like nobody can explain it you like taking an amp and that is on the edge of destruction and like rehabbing it and making some significant, you like modding things. Oh yeah. I love it. I I mean, I like to build, but aesthetically that is, you know, I mean, it, 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 that's one thing. It's sort of like taking a car and you know, Hey, it looks amazing now. And, and that's fine. But that sound is hard to convey to people. There's hard to have, it's hard to have a big reveal with that does that make sense yeah you're in this for like the, you, no you, you're in this for the sound yeah that's what and, floats your boat about this you're in this yeah. to, to find that um perfect sound you're almost like you know what there are people who are collectors like many years ago i used to collect fountain pens right uh-huh. and i had more fountain pens i mean I, I couldn't write as much so I, you know but it was always like you're searching for the holy grail of fountain pens Yes. And I think you're like that with sound. Yeah. I, I I compare amps to you're sculpting with a chainsaw. That's what it's all about. <laughs> it's not perfect. It is, you know, it's distorted and it's, you know, I can always give somebody a clean, totally clean amp and it is what it is, clean and dry. But you want that chaos whenever you lay into a chord or yeah. whatever. And... um this is just one of those things where it's like it's not perfect, but it's so good that it's you know it, it's it's hard to it's hard to describe to people, but it's almost this spiritual. Like I'll tell you this: if you were in my shop right now and you brought in whatever amp, it doesn't matter. Um, say you brought in like an old Supra or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're playing and I start changing in and out parts. And I do this with, with guys all the time. They come in with their guitar and they start playing and they're like, well, it sounds a little stale, a little whatever, blah, 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 blah. And so I start changing things out and manipulating the circuit. And it's funny because I can have them in the other room. I don't have to listen to them play. But I see their fingers start working more fluidly whenever I get to a spot that they like. Oh. And they go, oh, yeah, that sounds better. And I'm sitting there like, I don't know, asshole. I don't know if it sounds better or not, but you're playing better. So it's like there's something you sort of tap into their like weird playing subconscious. Yeah. And it's like they love it, man. They cannot get enough of it then. It's just like, holy crap, this is – you. I don't know what you did. And it, and it may be changing out two parts or something like that. Sure. But um, just knowing your parts and knowing your gear is part of what makes me good at this stuff. But, man, if you just sort of align that guitar with that guy's fingers, it's it's magic. It is something that I just can't describe. That's my favorite thing about doing this crap uh, <laughs> is, is, you know, fixing up an amp like that. And it doesn't even have to be a good one. I've done it with old shitty peavies and things like that where it's just you get it in that guy's hands and you start messing around and he just like he doesn't know why he loves it but he does and so sound junkies that's the sub headline it's high amplification sound junkies I like that. right yeah i think yeah. that's fit because it sounds like that's almost a fix for you yeah. yeah, it's it's great, and that's where I mean it really. Uh, there's just guys that fix stuff, and then I, I don't even care about that stuff anymore. You yeah, know what I mean? You just want to deliver the good sound, which is ultimately what people want, right? Yeah, and you know somebody can come in, and that's great if they're like, "Well, I've, you know, I need new tubes or something like that." That's nice and whatever. But I really I like taking things to the next level, and that's I've, I'm like that. I mean, I just. My personal philosophy, and it sounds super cheesy and weird, but I like to just take art to the next level. 
You know no, what I that's mean? What, what you just said, though, you don't look at this. I know exactly how you feel. You don't look at what you do as a job. You look at it as art. The, the amp is your canvas. Yeah. And I totally get that. I totally yeah. get that because I, in my, you know, my job, my other business, I write ad copy and I always look at it at the same time. Like words are my, you know, the paper is my canvas and it, I look at it as an art, not as a, so I need to go make some good art. And I know exactly, so I know exactly what you're saying. You have the same philosophy with, with amps, which I totally mm-hmm. get. And I gotta have it every day. I gotta make some kind of art every day. It's I'm a total, I'm as ADD and weird as anybody out there. But it's like I just got to have some kind of fix like that. I, and and it's amps are great. I, I'm still just as like excited about playing guitar as I was when I was eleven. And um, it's a uh, yeah. It's just always been that constant thing where it's just like I've. I love to take stuff to the next level when it comes to art in general. That's great, man. Very And the great. rest of the time, I'm uh, making fun of customers and drinking coffee and, you know. <laughs> Do you get to smoke cigars at, at your uh, place there? I don't because everybody complains about the smell. I get so. it. Yeah, I totally get that. Yeah. So. All righty. First time. Get over it. First time we spoke, you mentioned to me how much you love the sound of old Marshalls. And in your bio, you said, you know, you could remember the first time you heard a real Marshall. I'm assuming it was like a plexi or something. Oh, yeah. Do you, and to me, that's where I come back to that, that thing you said about the edge of distortion. Mm-hmm. Are your custom amps similar to old Marshall plexis? Or does that, I, it just depends on what the person wants. Well... It I, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's their amp, so I can't. Yeah, yeah. I do have to set it up for them, and uh, it depends on what the guy wants. Now, I do make an amp that is a Marshall, and I tried to put every Marshall that I like, everything about it, into one amp, and some stuff spills out. But um, I put that into one amp, and uh, it is, it is just. Uh, I'm not trying to toot my own horn or brag about it but no, it's just like somebody's going to be interested in it. i'm interested in it go ahead you you know that sound i mean so what kind of an amp is it is it like a combo a, or is it a, a separate head it's a marshall it's a big hundred watt head oh wow it's and big. um yeah and it's just like there's just not a bad sound in it i mean it even i hate master volumes but i love this master volume um I mean, going back, the first time I ever heard a Marshall, I grew up, I, you know, nobody had a big 100-watt Marshall. That, I mean, that was in Nashville. Are you kidding me? And so um, nobody could play that loud. And, you know, it was just – it was a foreign object, right, really. Right. Um, and then so I started working in this shop, and uh, this guy brings it in, and, you know, they're like, well, it's like any other amp. And it was, it had been in a basement. It was all rusted out. I took every, I took the sockets out, all the boards out. I took all the transformers off. We uh, brushed it all with uh, steel wool and then sprayed it up with, uh, with lacquer to stop the rust. What I mean, year it was amp was like it? 73, super oh, wow. trivial. And uh, just huge, meaty. It was all rusted out. It looked like it had been through a war. And, um, so anyway, though, we did all this stuff to it and, you know, just like weeks of work. And the guy was into it. He was like, yeah, I want you to restore this for me. And so we did all this stuff and we got it back together and uh, we, we put we recapped it and that kind of thing. And um, I turned it on as safely as I could. I turned it on, lit it up and just played an A chord through it. And like my pants shook. And like I was just like, holy shit! That was the what first time you'd ever sound? heard. Wow. Yes, I and then I was like, wait a minute, I know that sound. Like I've heard that on records that I love, hmm. and it was just like this power just came out of nowhere. And it's like this is this crappy thing that he found in a you know flooded out basement. And uh, after all this shit, it was just like it, it was familiar but it was also just like this physical sound just comes out at you 
Well, 100 watts you. is so yes. loud. So loud. But it was like, it was the most beautiful, like, it wasn't, it didn't have a lot of the, uh, like, high-pass filters in it. Somebody had cut those out. And so it was just this raw energy that came out. And it's one of those things where it's like you're, you're like, playing something physical as opposed to, oh, I'm just noodling around. Hmm. And uh, it was really, like, it was a moving experience. And so, so, like, the sound had its own presence Oh, yeah. yeah. And I got to tell you, everything, I mean, if you look at an old, like, tape echo and all that kind of stuff, any kind of physical sound, like, I always equate that to being very a, a very physical thing as opposed to, like, a just a delay pedal. But that physical sound coming out at you is just like, man, I'm listening to my favorite record right now. It's right. just like, it, it is It is so different than just playing a, you know, a, a PV. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so... We got it finished, and uh, I just couldn't believe it. I told the guy, I was like, "Man, if you ever sell this thing, I will, I will steal the money. Just let me know." And um, later on, I think uh, three or four years later, he broke it, and I bought it off of him. I still got it. Do you so, really? So you have yeah. a? Is, is it a? It's a combo or just a head? It's a head. So you Big have a hundred watt head. seventy-three Marshall head. Super wow. Tremolo. Yes. Wow, very cool. With the germanium transistor. It has to have that in it. Is that what gives it the cool distortion? No, that's a that's what runs the uh, tremolo. Is, oh, okay. Uh, okay. It's it's a smoother kind of a tremolo just because the germanium really doesn't work that well. It's not very efficient. And so it has sort of a smooth thing to it. But yeah. that thing's a monster, man. It's just like there's it, – it's – the the thing about a Marshall is they can be so loud, but yet at the same time they can be voiced to be so powerful and not ear damaging. Mm. And so, um, man, that's my favorite. That's me overindulging on steak. It's just <laughs> I gotta have it. I gotta have that. So very cool, man. Yeah. So that's um, more than you ever wanted to know about my Marshall. <laughs> no, no, no. I, that's perfect. Do you have like a line of high amps, or are they just custom made? Because I saw on YouTube there was a uh, a demo of the Heim Hurricane. Is that like an actual line of yours, or is that a how does how does that work? It is. I uh, that is based off of the Supro, um, and it, there's some changes to it. What I mostly do is um, I will take an old amp and I'll make changes to it. Um, See, the uh, people always ask me about this. They're like, what's your favorite amp? And I'm like, I don't know that I have a favorite other than, you know, just a big Marshall, but you can't play that all the time. And so the 60s were really this cool time for amp circuits because everybody was really getting um, – they were really getting, you know, experimental with it. They were trying to figure out different ways to EQ something and all that stuff. And some of them are failures and some of them are great. And uh, I love the Supro circuit, but there's changes that could be made to it. And that was my version. That's the most dynamic amp that I can think of as far as like a little low wattage amp. It has 6973s, which are jukebox tubes. And uh, there's so much nuance to it, but it's not a loud amp. How many watts? I'd say about 15 watts, roughly. That's perfect. So is that like a 1 by 12 cabinet? Is it a combo? Yeah. Yeah. That's Mm -hmm. really cool. Now that cabinet, that one that I make, it's 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 kind of I lost a lot of money on that because it is a trapezoid. And what I found with it was with that trapezoid, it sort of projects out this mid-range that sort of hits you in the chest, you know, as you back away from it, if that makes sense. And so I also I I use so Russian mean, birch. So what do you mean you lost a lot of money on 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 that on putting that one together or in ge- in general I'm, I'm confused in general because making a trapezoid amp is very it's time consuming uh, okay. and it takes a lot of Why don't you it just takes tra- a lot of doing charge it. more for it well uh, if, if people would buy it i would yeah, okay <laughs> i get you i get you um it's one of those things i mean for a 15 watt amp people are only going to spend so much money and I gotcha. uh, you know and uh, th- i also understand that i'm just some chump in a basement and they're not going to buy it from me. They're going to, you know, buy it from a name. And and that's okay. That's all right. I don't know but, about um, that. I think if people like the sound. 
Well, it's it, it's it's it is what it is. But yeah. I also am very ADD, so I move on to other projects really quickly too. Oh. And so I also have my my version of the Tweed Deluxe, which I, everybody this is where I start getting all the hate mail uh, Why? when I say this. There is a design flaw in the Tweed Deluxe. Which is? The 57 Tweed Deluxe. Well, I can't really tell you, but... Okay. The... Uh, <laughs> you have to pay for that um, content. Yes. Yes, absolutely. There's a slight adjustment that you can make to the front-end game to where... Uh, usually, a lot of the times, the Tweed Deluxe, it will start to like kind of fart out when you get low, and it's got kind of a woolly sound to it. And uh, the old ones do have some magic, but that's 60 years of heat and cigarette smoke and all that stuff. So uh, if you go and pick out a hand-wired 57 tweed from Guitar Center, you're going to plug into it and you're going to be really disappointed because it, it sounds terrible. It's just a bad-sounding amp, and that's because of this design flaw. And so I make a tweed that that is made, in my opinion, properly. And I got to tell you, I will put it up against any Tweed Deluxe you can think of because it is it sounds so much better this way. And Al so alternatively, if someone has a Tweed and they want to bring it in for you for the mod, do you do that as well? Oh, yeah, sure. OK, mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, great. Um, mm -hmm. But that that is one of those things that it's like this is so much better. It brings it more into focus for the guitar. As opposed to you know what it is, which is just a woolly, weird thing, and like I say, some people love it the way they are, and that's fine. But uh, I still think my way is better, and and this is all opinion. Sure, sure. So, but, but yeah, that and then the big Marshall, and those are pretty much the ones that I stick with. Right. No, but I think. Look, I think it's really good that you've got this passion for the sound because ultimately that's why people are coming to you. Mm -hmm. you. You know, they're not come. Yeah, they want you to repair their amp, but excuse me. After you listen to it, if it's if you can do something, sorry again. Uh, it's all about the sound. I mean, that's why you're playing an amp, as you said. You know, you get the guitar and you get your amp. Yeah. So, and that's why they get they. That's why I make a lot of people angry because I take longer than it should because it's just until it's right there with me then uh, you know what I'm trying to get I just don't want to give it back <laughs> I just uh, it's uh, it's got to get to a certain it's kind of like mastering a record sometimes you know you, you mess with it mess with it mess with it and then you need to take a break and then you go back and then you go huh fresh ears really help man it's the same way and in, in, it's funny in writing ad copy you get to a point where you got to set it aside then read it again a couple of days later or something yeah uh, you just got to step away from it yeah. and i don't think that heavy heavy focus ever helps you in creativity i just don't hmm. uh staring at a blank page is not going to get you know your award-winning novel on it no you need fodder you need, yes. you need, you need prompt, you know, idea, I call them idea prompts from some place or somewhere. And that makes your life a lot easier. Yeah, it does. And then and stuff, it, it just flows out of you whenever you've got that going. And I just, you know, hitting your head against the wall, hard focusing on something. It just, it, I feel like you just kind of do a, whatever you're doing the project, a little bit of disservice. And so I totally get that. I have this expression that, uh, when we're in a rut, we all tend to dig faster. But it, it, in my experience, the thing to do is you got to put down the shovel altogether. Yeah, and that's when you get the 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 freedom, the fresh ideas come in, or the perspective that you need. This, in my yeah. opinion, anyway. No, I totally. I'm right there with you. And I'll tell you something. I do. I'll do overdubs at my house, and. Uh, you know, people will send me a record and say, hey, noodle off of this or do whatever. And uh, I love doing it. But what a lot of the times what I'll do is I'll get up before I'm supposed to get up, go down there and just turn on an amp and play. And before your mind starts going, you suck and you're terrible. And what are you doing? And, uh, you know, why did you say yes to this before your mind starts up all that stuff? You get down there and you just start playing and start just throwing in stuff. And some, uh, I feel like my best stuff comes out whenever I'm not, you know, when I'm in the moment, whenever that's 
that's the deal. And I am one of those people that if some guy walks up to me on the street that basically looks homeless and goes, hey, let's make a bluegrass record. I'm like, <laughs> OK, yeah, let's do that. Let's, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm in. Let's go. Any kind of an art pursuit, I'm going to go after it. Right, right. And so that's to me, that's my that's how I feel about it. Very but, cool, man. Well, hey, uh, again, I have angry customers. Yeah, but do they come back? That's true. They do. They yeah, well, so. they know they can abuse me. So yeah. Maybe that's oh, true. they're coming back. <laughs> now people aren't. When it comes to money, people are pretty dead serious. So they're going to come back. That's because, true. Yeah, they're you know. Uh, where are you originally from? Are you from? Uh, well, I grew up here. My parents. My mom moved us up here when I was five, but I grew up in Nashville. I've been here oh, wow. ever since the dawn of time, <laughs> and um, it was. It's interesting. It's not even it's it's in no way the same as it was when I was a kid. Oh, I'm sure. Man, yeah, just some, I, the, we were there last year. I couldn't even drive. It was so much it was like every corner is like being developed literally. Yeah, uh, there's streets I don't even recognize anymore. It's yeah. really weird. And well, people I don't know. I know everybody. Oh, still, yeah, cuz it's like a small town in a sense. In, in, it is. Yeah. And working out at uh, the old shop I mean, I knew uh, the old shop. It was funny because back in those days, in the mid 2000s, you could. I've told people this, and this makes me sound like a real asshole, but back in those days, we were the only game in town. You could tell customers that, you know, you could tell them, hey, you know, screw you, leave me alone, blah, 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 blah. And they'd still say, well, can you still look at me? <laughs> I mean, they would, it was just, there was no other place to go. Now there's, there's a bunch of new amp techs. There's uh, people that I've never met, whatever, that just moved here. You know, there's all that stuff now. It's weird. Yeah, I'm sure it's a big change. Yeah. What What, what, what was your childhood like? Uh, mostly boring. Um, oh. <laughs> no, I, uh, you know, there, it's... Uh, <laughs> That's an honest answer. <laughs> it was, uh, well, as ADD as I am, it, you have to understand, I am, uh, I'm, I'm, it takes a lot to entertain me anyway. Right. But, um, it was pretty normal. I, my, my mom worked, uh, all the time and would just leave us at home and uh, you kind of fall into the watching TV thing. And I started watching MTV Hmm. and, um, this was back in the, the dawn of MTV when they play music. Yeah. When they play music. (laughs) And I'll tell you this though, I'm so glad I cherish all of that stuff that I saw because I don't know if you remember this back in the days, but MTV, when they had no money, they would take old commercials and old stock footage and all that stuff, and they would just make their advertisements out of that. Yeah, they had really and, cool advertisements back then. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. And, you know, on top of that, nobody had a script that they were going on, on and uh, they they made these, like, weird visual art deals i mean you know being i remember my dad seeing flock of seagulls and just being like what the hell is this shit <laughs> uh, i mean you know like what are you watching this oh, is just man. with the southern so accent weird. you had going there that was good uh yeah it, it comes out when i talk to my family yeah or was... when i've had a few drinks but um <laughs> the that to me i mean that sort of like got me into art in general yeah. is you know, and then of course I got into heavier music. I uh, I just love guitar music, and um, you know, of course, early Metallica and all that stuff. And then on the other hand, all the new wave stuff. You know, the Cars and the Police and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just loved it all, and um, I never could fit into a group because they were like, "What are you? Are you punk? Are you a thrash? Are you what? I mean, you know, do you?" you like Morrissey what's what's with you and so <laughs> you just liked it all I liked it all I mean I could just eat it all up and I there's a lot of music I didn't like of course my mom's um my mom's uh Bee Gees records I was never a fan of but the um it was just music and art in general I was just so into it I just you know I just couldn't get enough and so that and being crazy compulsive uh is really a thing with me so well, well let me ask you that you got a degree in classical guitar mm-hmm. what was more compelling about electricity than playing music 
was? Uh, well, I, I, to be honest with you, I just liked taking on a, a piece. I just enjoyed, you know, everything was there. You, you are the whole song. And I just loved that I could sit down, just me and a guitar, and just do a whole show. And uh, it was, I just loved the challenge, and I just, I just thought it was great. I loved the technique. I loved the craft of playing a classical guitar piece or nylon string guitar piece or whatever you want to call it. But I just loved that it was, I was doing everything, and it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't like, notes 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 it was here's the bass line here's the melody here's all this stuff and it's just on the neck of the guitar and uh it was fascinating to me i loved it and i i thought that that was going to be my whole life was doing these guitar competitions and you know making these classical guitar records and all that stuff and it's just not very popular here in america but another reason was when i went to college I just didn't – I felt like that was the only way I was going to make a living playing guitar because I had – there was a lot of guys that were into jazz and stuff like that. And it's like, who wants to hear you noodle over chord changes? I just didn't think that that was a way to make money. And I could go play a wedding with just me and a guitar. You know, I could do, always do them walking down the aisle. And um, I could play at a church and stuff like that and – that's how I paid my student loan for a for a bit was just, just playing. playing guitar. Yeah, but you grab. But my but my question was, you gravitated away from that into electricity. So what? Why did well, you? Well, that's wh- weird. Yeah. What uh, was why? Because you're so enthusiastic about guitar, yet you went into electricity. What was the well the, the juice there? To be honest with you, I uh, I thought that I would also do film scoring and things like that mm. because I had the I had the skill and all that stuff. So I thought, okay, this is very simple for me to just, you know, buy a bunch of crap and then just throw together TV commercial music or something like that. And so I got a job at this the only place that would hire me right out of college cuz you know nothing when you get out of college. Right. You well, just what year debt. was this? What year was this? Uh, well, <laughs> this was uh uh, 1999. Okay. And so I get out of college and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to start, you know, trying to do some type of scoring, some type of film scoring, whatever. And, um, I got a job at this really, really crappy, like video production house. And the guy that owned it was a total weirdo. <laughs> he, he was so strange and just, uh, he was brilliant, but just no social skills. And, um, what he would do was he he had all this broadcast gear and uh, every all of it was broken he would go to these nasa auctions and that's right i said nasa which i didn't even think you could do that he would go to nasa auctions and just buy junk and bring it back and put it in his warehouse do they have nasa auctions in nashville yes in oh, Na- i, I, could tell well, you I so thought they'd be down in like it. you know jupiter florida or something like that or you know wherever they have it in florida Oh, he would. Uh, he had a truck. He would load it up. He had a truck with a trailer, and he would just load it up with all this crap. Holy and he'd go down. You could do it in Alabama, which is not too far away. Mm. And they had a couple of other auctions. But there were times where we actually, not to get too off track, but there were times where he would buy sensitive research equipment. And we'd call and ask him what it was, and they'd say, send it back. We're sorry. We didn't mean to sell that. Really? That's funny. <laughs> yeah, it was It was wild, man. Uh, there was stuff. Wait a minute. We, you mean um, the government was unorganized? Uh, yeah, that's, just a little that's bit. That's so hard. That's weird. I'm so hard to. I'm shocked to hear that. There was stuff that we would buy, <laughs> and it was always something like you know we. It was. It looked like a spaceship or something like. I, I'm not kidding. It, this is this is no hyperbole at all. I it, th- we would get stuff that was like it was a model of something, obviously, and. Uh, We'd call them up and say, hey, what is this? You know, or you'd find somebody and they're like, uh, you need to send that back to us. And they would send us a, a shipping. Post is paid envelope. It <laughs> yeah, it, it was wild stuff. But So I, what would I, he I do with all this talk. stuff? Uh, he would just like store it away. And his he was a hoarder. He would buy oh. a whole 
he would buy a bunch of stuff just to get a case. He oh, would just, okay. He was just, you know, weird it's, dude. it was just crap. It was stuff. And so anyway, he had a bench in there and, um, I just really, everything was broken, like I say. And, uh, I really had a good time, like figuring out how to fix some of this stuff. Okay. And, uh, I started getting books and I, I, you can buy old military books from the sixties for like a dollar. Right. And it would teach you about a resistor and this is what it does and blah, 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 blah. And so I was like, man, this is, this is interesting. And then I got the idea, well, man, what if I just started fixing amps? I actually ran into a friend of mine from college over at a circle K and I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm fixing amps with this guy. And I was like, Hmm, well, that's playing. And, you know, that can't be all bad because I got to tell you, I mean, a lot of people ask me this. They're like, why did you go into this? In Nashville, you have what they call manufacture. I call it manufactured music. You're a session guy. Right. And it is mind numbingly boring. It is. We do you know about the Nashville numbers chart? Yes. Yes. OK. We have. Yeah, I do know that. OK, well, um, you can look it up. It's uh, for the listeners. You can look it up. Yeah, it's, it's just it's a, me- it's a method of where everybody could understand the chord changes and what's going on. It's pretty straightforward. It's just a one chord, then it moves to the four chord and it moves to the right. five chord and how many bars. It's, yeah. Yeah. And it sort of keeps things, uh, you know, it's supposed to be a freestyle way of, you know, making a song. Yeah. But, man, it is so boring. It is just they don't want to hear your opinion. Everybody wants to go to lunch. It's just it's you know I when 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 I grew up, uh, I've said this before, but it's like making a record. It was like you'd hear about these guys that would take drugs and stay up for two weeks and make the wall <laughs> and you know all these great records. But these guys they don't care at all. They're just like I've I've been in sessions where they won't even change the chart. They'll just change the melody and the lyrics. And that's it. It's uh-huh. like they write the record right there and it's just they just want to get it over with. And so uh, for me it was So it was just, too formulaic it was, basically. Is what you yeah, yeah, it was just boring and it was you have to be able to you have to play bad stuff and and embrace it. And it was just that was really I just couldn't go into that. And then doing road gigs was i mean you burn up the road you lose your mind uh it doesn't pay anything uh the music business has really taken a turn in nashville since the 90s the Mm. 90s people were making hand over fist money they just don't do that anymore well because the you know the on bootlegging online and the ease of you know digital versus yeah you know And, and you know, back in the '90s, like a session guitar player would make as much or more as a, a a doctor, like a specialist. Nowadays, you know, they don't certainly don't make that kind of money. But those two were that was kind of your option, other than playing weddings and stuff like that. And so it just wasn't for me. Right. And so I uh, I started messing with amps, and like I say, I got fascinated i started a job at this shop i didn't really know very much i lied i said oh yeah i know some electronics and i knew very very little not enough to get around really and um uh i went in there and i remember the first day he was sitting there working on an old silver tone 1484 and if you know anything about those amps they are complete shit they're toys oh yeah they're toys but he was messing with it, and all of a sudden, this thing came alive. It was like it was like one of the best amps I'd ever heard. Oh. And so I was like, wow. He just took the shittiest amp that's a toy, and he just made that thing great. He made chicken salad out of chicken shit right in front of you. Yes. Wow. Yes. And then that was it. I was like, oh, my God. I got to do this. So you were and hooked. So I was, man. I was just like, and besides that, having a job where you get to play all day, I mean, I was yeah, in that's, heaven. that's not a bad deal. Yeah. And so uh, that that totally got me, that got me into it. And then, you know, at night I would read those military books. During the day I would get yelled at by him and, uh, you know, work away, work away, work away. So... Is, over the years, is there an amp that you consider to be like the holy grail of amps, like something that sonically, and maybe you answered this with the Marshall 
but um, is there something that you've seen that's like every one of them you've seen just like, you know, rocks your world? There is an old amp called a Masco. And they are SCO? Yes. They are from the 50s. They are, they're PA amps, essentially, from, you know, a high school or something like that, church. And those things have this, if you've got a guy that can, I mean, you know me, I, I can go gainy or whatever, but like that amp, it has octal preamp tubes in it. What is and that? Like in layman's they, terms. Okay. Uh, well, you know how most amps nowadays, they've got 12X7 preamp tubes and then you've got your power tubes. Okay. This is old school metal tubes and they call them octal tubes because it takes an octal socket or eight pin socket. Okay. And they're super microphonic. They're just, you can't buy a new one. And what, what does that mean, microphonic? Sorry. Microphonic is like uh, if you tap on it, it'll go ping, ping, ping. Okay. Well, these things have this life. Uh, they, they're like wine. They're, they're not the same. They have this crazy nuanced sound. And uh, it is so big and expansive that it's like, uh, if I can... I don't know if this is a good thing, but you know how when something is amplified, you basically see stuff as up and down. Yeah. Well, this sort of sonically has this like wider sound. It's sort of like there's a it's sort of like there's the note, but there's also this presence to it. It's called a Masco amp. Yes. What do they sell and, for? Uh, you could find a broken one for probably uh, probably free. Uh, oh, wow. It takes a lot to get it going. Oh, it uh, does. They got kind of popular after a while there, but uh, they have these these tubes that just you know it totally wasn't even made for a uh, guitar. What, but what was it made I, for? Uh, just you know, plug in and come, come to the office, please. Oh, uh, that's I'm gonna basically look this up what right it's made now. For. Masco amps. Just yeah. on a quick see if we can get anything here. Oh yeah, there's a bunch of them. Reverb. Oh, they're not so cheap. Really? They go yeah. Uh, the ones from the 50s. There's one, I can't remember what they, it's called. They've got cool, they're like, the graphics on them are very cool, and they're very 50s looking. Well, this one's a, okay, so it's a Masco Sound Systems Harp Amp. It is completely, it must weigh 1,000 pounds because it's 12 to 15 watts, and they want $400 shipping. So this has got okay. to be it's 1947 Masco harp amp running two six v six v six GTs into a one by twelve Alnico speaker. Now that speaker, man, somebody's done some work to that. But that's Somebody. that speaker's got to be beat up, no? From night if it's a, if it's the original speaker, isn't that even possible? Oh yeah, I have I have several of those still around, and I have old wow. tubes from back then that still work great and. But the the old Mascos, there's one in particular. I'll have to find a picture and send it to you. Yeah, I'd be interested in that. But I've had I've rebuilt those things for people, and they can't believe it. It's just it's like it's it's so it's different, but it's also just uh, I mean it is it's weird. It just sings like it's like angels are singing along with your guitar. <laughs> wow. And, but it's also this like really wild, beautiful distortion. It's amazing. Okay. So let, let's dig into this a little more. This is here. A Masco 56 ME 27 PA 20 watt head. Modif- I think that's it. Modified for guitar, bass, and harmonica, harmonica. Dual 6L6s. What do the graphics look like? Uh, it's got... Is it like- Microphone one, knobs. microphone two, no white knobs on a kind of a gray body. Microphone oh, one, and microphone it. two, phono and tone. Mm-hmm. I and, think that's it. And then it's it's got a six SJ seven and two six L six Gs. And uh, yeah, someone's done some work on here because they're showing a picture. Mic one, mic two, phono. What the hell does that even mean? That's uh, well, that's for your phonograph. Oh, I mean, in like in normal, in like guitar terms, though. Oh, I I don't know. Usually, back in the days, your phono input was a different impedance. It was a hotter impedance. So, um, 
you can I mean you can of course set that most guitar impedances other than an ampeg are one meg and I forgot what the phono one is but um that's okay it, you're it, actually talking like foreign language to me at this point oh, well, uh, sorry you know everything has an impedance to ground and guitar is a very high impedance and so like uh, a guitar is basically one million ohms from ground I get you. So uh, anyway, the uh, you can that's basically how you set up an old PA for a, to be a guitar amp is you change the impedance of the input that, that's, and then that's what he did it here. will couple in the sound. The phono yeah. the phono control and input is disconnected to reduce loading on the circuit and the mic one and mic new mic one and mic two inputs are in wired together in parallel with one channel a little brighter than the other. It's had a cap job. Now, this one's a lot more reasonably priced. But what's interesting is that it says it's a 20-watt head, but if you look at the specs on the back, it was originally 100 watts, which is pretty wild because it's not well, really big. that was also an industrial amp. So you could – you would uh, – sometimes they would – if they ran a long run out, you would go to another transformer that would couple into a speaker. Okay. So you had 100 um, – you had high impedance outs on it as well. So okay. then they have your burgundy one that you were talking about here. Oh God! That, that man. one's twenty bucks. That one's only it's twelve watts, uh, only two hundred and seventy bucks. So interesting. So people check out the Masco amps. Just get a Masco. No, head. you shouldn't check them out. You should just leave them alone and forget about them. Uh, no, buy them and then let the price fall. Bring them into <laughs> Jeff's shop to get modded. That's what you should do. I won't give them back. Uh, <laughs> They're, that those it has those octal tubes in it and uh, the 6SJ7 and the 6SL7 and all that stuff and uh, man I got it to, I always I make this I don't mean to sound chauvinistic but well I'll put it this way they're like lovers they are wonderful but at the same time they'll break your heart <laughs> so uh, uh, <laughs> and I know women would say men are like that and men would say women are like that or vice versa whatever but it is that right there it's like they're they can be noisy and microphonic and all that stuff but at the same time if there's a more beautiful sound i haven't heard it and you can distort so. these you can get distortion out of these oh yes see if They're i if beautiful. i lived around the corner i'd buy one of these and then bring it into you to have it looked at because this is just so intriguing um it is um there's other amps that will do th- this but i haven't really that i don't know of any that do it as well as the masco Ma- all right masco and here you heard it first that's not th- nothing that's not something anybody would have heard before i would bet you now um, i'll tell you this yeah. the the marshall is a different thing the marshall is more of this like push power it's more of um if you want to sound powerful if you want to like shake the ground so to speak then I would go with a Marshall because it has that like – it's almost like a current amplifier as opposed to a voltage amplifier. It's like there there is so much energy that comes out of that that it's very different than the Masco kind of a thing, if that makes sense. Not to me because I'm not smart enough to understand this, but I guarantee you Yes, people, you are. You're pe- smarter than I am. Uh, not on this for sure. I don't know about that. That's a big uh, – Big assumption. I'm just a kid in a candy store. I <laughs> we used to just take in everything. You know, if somebody brought it in, even if they knew what it was or wasn't what it wasn't, we would work on it. We yeah. would <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's we'll a great way it. to learn though. What a great it way is. to learn. It's it like is. baptism and I by saw fire. Wacky stuff. Yeah. That's yeah, really it, cool. It, that's exactly it. I but like that. it was uh it's interesting to find all the stuff that's out there, you know, to that you have at your disposal. Well, and well, Masco's a sleeper. Heard it here, folks. What modern day amp basically do you that is not as good as you th- people think it is? That you're, you know, people buying it it's supposed to be great, and you're seeing it show up in your shop for repair more often the than it t- should be. The Tweed Deluxe. It's yeah. uh, it sounds terrible. It's just I don't get it. I don't see how people put that out and then go, yeah, this is the one. I am pretty sure I have asked the same question to someone else, and that's the same answer that I got. The the a, a modern Fender, and I don't know if it's a Tweed Deluxe, but I'm almost positive they said it must be because they said it was a modern Fender. Now I will tell you this: 
I can the 68 Drip Edge Deluxe and Vibrolux and Twin and all that kind of stuff is a great value. That you is mean the modern app. reissue of that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And people always go, well, I don't like it because it's circuit board. I've never had a problem fixing the circuit board. I've never had a problem out of the circuit board. So uh, it sounds and, it sounds good even though it's not a tube amp. That's right. It's a tube amp. Oh, it, it is? It is a tube amp. Okay. Yeah, it's a reissue of the Drip Edge 68 um, okay. fenders. And they're great. they got a nice speaker in there. They're They're really a good amp. And I can make them sound old. Too. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so it's that for I mean, sometimes you can get those for under a thousand dollars. The effects are in both channels, not like the originals. Mm. And um there are two channels that are a little bit different from each other. And uh like I say, I can really tweak on them and make them sound great. As a matter of fact, I had a guy who was making a record, he had an original sixty eight and then he brought in his reissue and I did my little thing to it, basically just made it sound old with some components. And uh, he sold his original because <laughs> he loved it so much. You're kidding and, me. Uh, no, it's it's really, you know, with that speaker and that configuration, you can really get some cool stuff out of it. And so. Hey, so let me ask you this. Okay. So I have a Maz Senior, 38 watts. It's got okay. a master volume and a, and a reverb tank. Man, uh, uh, Dr. C, Mike Dr. Zadie. C. Yeah, yeah. So it's a great amp, but I don't play out. It's a bedroom amp. So it's like I need a water pistol and I got a fucking, you know, tank. Mm -hmm. Is there something you can – and I also don't like that I can't get really distortion out of it. Maybe it's because I just can't turn it up to where I need to. Yeah, can can you do something with that amp? Yeah, there's that possible? things you could do. You could um... – now, the tone is maybe another story, but, like, you could make the power tubes uh, triode, which will knock the, you know, knock the power down. Uh, you could, you could uh, do my little master volume trick. Uh, you can always get one of those power soaks. Um, is that like an attenuator? Yes. Yeah, okay. So you maybe I'll bring, that. maybe I'll bring this with me if I come up, because, like, right now I'm looking at it, man, I got to sell this. The thing I like about it is the reason I bought it, and I was playing it very loud in the shop. I had a modern Fender. It was awful. And the reason I like this is I, I, I asked the guy, I said, listen, I'd like an amp that when I play my SG, it sounds like an SG. When I play my Les Paul, it sounds like a Les Paul. When I play my Strat or my Tele, because I didn't get that out of the Fender. It all, they all sounded the same. This is a modern mm -hmm. Fender. Yeah. So um, I like the sound, but I'm like, the thought of having to sell it and then get another one you know it's a, like an exhausting process if i could just make right. some have have some mods made to it there's a now i don't know much about attenuators cuz that's sort of against my religion but the um well then i wouldn't I do it then i want to do stuff that's you know <laughs> no i mean seriously i mean like if you don't know about it my thoughts are is okay there's a reason why and that's because for whatever it is even if it's your own like voodoo that you're against it that's fine well uh, yeah the attenuators to me say back in the days all we had was the hot plate and um i just didn't i didn't like the idea of it it really took away some of the highs and some of the lows okay i feel like i'm going into the wrong impedance now um i have recommended but i haven't played a uh the Rivera. Oh, I know uh, those amps. Power Soak, I think is what it's called or something. I could be wrong. But um, I've heard people tell me, yeah, that's really good. And Paul Rivera is a super sweet, very smart guy. Um, I have worked behind and owned Rivera's before, and uh, it, he makes great stuff. Mm. So I Where, is he out of Nashville? would stand behind it. No, he's in California. Okay. Yeah, because I he's think he's great, though. Is he? Yes, he's um, an excellent, excellent amp guy, and and a nice person too. I'll talk to you more about this after the call. Maybe I have a question. Okay, so how about the other side of the coin? And maybe answer this right. As my question is, what amps out there are sleepers? You talked about the Masco. Mm -hmm. What else that delivers tremendous value, and and you know they're priced great for what you're getting. Well, you know, this being Nashville, this is a Fender town. Yeah, and so. 
I think that getting the Drip Edge uh, 68 reissue stuff is really like the that's the best value it when is. it comes to just sounding Nashville. Um, but I sort of categorize amps into sort of two uh, two categories. You got your British and then you got your American. Okay. And that Fendery thing is very Nashville and it's very American sounding. Uh, American tubes, obviously, and all that stuff. But then you got the British stuff, which your Maz 18, I believe is what you said it was. It's, it's a Maz Senior. It's a 38. The 18 38. would probably be fine. It, that's the problem. It's a 38 watt. It's like, uh, it's like, yeah, it's, it's way too big for, a, you know, it's a great thing. If, even if I had a gig out, an 18 would be enough, unless I'm playing them. Well, 18 is going to be loud too. I mean, they, uh, nothing is perceived as loud as tubes. Um, and, uh, for example, if you take a solid state amp, like say you take a 200 watt solid state amp, you're going to, it's going to be loud and it's going to shake the room and all that stuff. But you take a 200 watt tube amp and it will take your face off. It's going to, it's hearing damage loud. And so nothing is perceived as loud as tubes. One is a voltage amplifier. One is a current amplifier. And, uh, the uh that eight i mean i tell people all the time they're like well i don't know i should get a 50 watt marshall and i'm oh like oh my god you can but you know what there's really only like i think there's only like 5 db difference and it doesn't have the big wide thing that a 100 watt has and so i, I say just go to town just Th- let it eat yeah. but the um you know there's always places i take my tweed deluxe on gigs and man i they tell me to turn it around and huh. can you turn down and all that stuff and i'm like what are you talking about this is 20 watts <laughs> but oh it, it, so i need to dial down maybe like to 15 watts or something or 10 possibly watts. possibly yeah uh you know what else i think that the uh blues junior and the uh blues the little amps like that for the money, I think those are great amps, and I can also make those sound uh, old as well. I like the British brown sound, though. If I'm honest, that's my era. You that's know, pretty I, close. It is okay. I mean, they are. Yeah, the, the, they're. I would consider that more to be a British. It's got EL eighty fours in it, so that's a British tube. Okay. Um, and that I would say is closer to uh, you know a British. I mean, I know it is Fender, but. It, that has more of a Britishy kind of AC15 thing than uh, it does a Fender thing. You know what? They had a Vox. They had an AC30 there, and I said, "Well, what about this?" And again, I'm I've been playing guitar two years, so I don't I don't I'm not experienced. And the guy said, "It doesn't take pedals well." And I said, "Okay." Now I don't use a lot of pedals, but I said, "Okay." I, I didn't. Does that make sense or no? Or is he just trying to get, uh, not, not sell the Vox and? Or it was just the Vox or a Supra, and maybe he just wanted to sell this one. I don't know. Uh, that I don't, but I don't agree with him. Yeah, I, I've um, had other people say the same thing. I. It depends on what kind of pedals, I guess you would say. Uh, it is certainly not an ant. The thing about an AC30 is they have a sweet spot, mm-hmm. and usually it's too loud. But gotcha. the AC30 is sort of like in its own realm. I mean. We don't even have enough time to talk about the AC30. That is a uh, – they're sort of like a different instrument. Um, they are – they're they're wonderful. They're heartbreaking. They're weird. Um, they do have a sweet spot though. And, um, and se- for example, 70% of the circuit of an AC30 is that tremolo. That whole warbling tremolo pitch shifter, mm-hmm. that's – that's most of the I could put you together in AC30 if I had all the parts in an afternoon. But that that uh warbly pitch shifting thing that they do is very complicated and you know at the time people don't understand but that was like cutting edge technology and uh it's you know y- yeah Hammond is very um you know that's a that's a wacky circuit, but man, the AC30 is that is something unto itself. Uh-huh. It runs too hot. Uh, the transformers smell like burning candles because they're dipped in wax and they get too hot and they melt. Um, there's uh, there's all kinds of stuff with that amp that um, it, it's 
it's it's something. I don't. I just don't. I mean, people that are AC thirty people, you have to be all the way. You have to have the Celestian Blue Alnico speakers in there. Otherwise, you don't have the sound. Gotcha. And and people go, well, what does that even mean? And uh, those speakers are very fast. They right up under your fingers, and they have that separated mid range that only an AC thirty is going to give you. And so it's uh, I mean that. It's just people just don't understand how complicated the whole AC30 genre is. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a lot of stuff. Is and the AC15 so, the same same situation? It's a little bit different. The AC15s had the EF86 pintoed in it, and that was a really cool sound. But it just it isn't it isn't the same. It's if not that's, the same. Yeah, it's just not. They're very cool, but they just sound too small and boxy. For the AC30 thing, the AC30 thing is just this—it's this dazzling, pretty broken glass mid-range. If you can get it working right, that—that <laughs> uh, uh, that, uh, no other amp is going to have that. And so, uh, Matchless and even Doctor Z—they're sort of going after that AC30 thing. Right. And uh, it is. Man, it's it's hard to get people. If anyone ever comes up to me and says, "Well, I don't really like AC 30s I'm like, "Well, you've never played one that you that's been fixed. You, gotcha. you don't know what you're talking about because it is really a harmonically just over the top amp, and uh, very, very, very few people have ever heard one. You know, really, really tweaked up and ready to go." And so, and like I say, they're always on the edge of failing. <laughs> on the edge of distortion, the edge of what yes. was it? The edge of destruction. The edge of destruction. Yes. yes. Jeff is an AC30 dealer. No, I'm not. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right. Oh God, they don't make them like that anymore. They, there's no way. I, I wouldn't even. I would never attempt to make an amp like that because you have to be an amp tech to really play a good. Well, well, old that's one. what I'm hearing, man. It's like that's why I don't own vintage guitars. It's just too much work involved. I'm on a need to know basis, man, and I just don't have yeah. the time. I don't have the time. I wish I did. A uh, few questions for you. If you weren't doing what you're doing now, what do you think you'd be doing instead? What other I'd art? Be a Vegas art Vegas mess. lounge singer. Of course. Are you kidding? Of course. <laughs> I mean, oh my god. Yeah, I, I, I people have asked me that before, and it's like without hesitation, I go do that right now. Serious? Oh, you're not kidding. You'd literally be a Vegas lounge singer. Absolutely. Oh wow. Absolutely. What? What? what wow. Okay. So what's the compo- What is the like attractive about that? I thought you were joking. I l- I love everything about it. I um, just Vegas or this, lounge singing in general. Like I love what? Vegas, and uh, I actually do. Uh, everybody in Nashville plays. Everybody's in a band here. Everybody yeah. does gigs. And uh, I do an 80s cover band, and um, it's super fun. But it's – I don't know. I just love it. It's a, its art, and it's also – it's a show, and I'm – I don't know. I just uh, – there you I, go. I just love it. That's a new first. And, I would be a Vegas lounge singer. You heard it here on everyone. Absolutely guitar. awesome. Like I say, I would go do it right now, but I've you know I have a dog. So. <laughs> Most important person in your life. Uh, it'd be my girlfriend, definitely. That's good. So now you could play this for her. And right, yeah, exactly. You'll, you'll, maybe she won't be too mad at me. Either. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what's your greatest strength, Jeff? I don't know. I don't know that I have a lot of. Come on, you got to have a superpower. Of... What's your no, one superpower? I, I don't know. I. Uh, In fact, I'm going to change you... the question because I like that question better. What's your superpower? I'm going to change that. Yeah, that is a good question. What's your one? I don't superpower? know that I have a superpower. I think I can tell you things that make me better, if that helps. Um. But I don't know that I have anything like that. That's an interesting question. It is. Um, I used to think I was a, a really good dancer, but turns out I'm not. Well, you don't need to do that to be a lounge singer. They're pretty motionless, I think, pretty much. So if, if That's you true, do have to make man, the career change. if you can put change, in some moves, you are something. There you go. So, <laughs> you're the full package. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Single in a relationship, you have a girlfriend. How long have you guys been together? Uh, six years. Well, that's good. And man. yes, 
she is human and she does deal with me. So yeah, man, you know what? I'm just thinking, man, she is probably a saint. <laughs> yes. Yes, she is. She's got to have the patience of like, cause you're like all, you know, I'm a maniac. You got the ADD thing going. You're like, holy shit, I'm having a hard time keeping up with you. And I'm like, yeah, reasonably. She's, uh, I, I cannot believe that. Uh, that's one of the biggest things about our relationship that I think about a lot is it's like, I can't believe you deal with me <laughs> <laughs> because I'm just like, I'm all over the place. And uh, I just go whole hog into stuff. I'm just all the way, you know, I'm. Yeah, but the flip side to that is you're probably the same way with her. Like, yeah, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're really into mm-hmm. her. You're probably re- protective of her. And, you know, you give her the attention. She, You know, it, it works all all around, you know. That's so true. It's kind of like yeah. a blessing and a curse. But I think we all have behavior. I know I certainly do that are like that as well, you know. Her curse. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, uh, yeah, I mean, that's uh, – I, I told her just the other day. I was like, man, it's really – I don't know that God really smiled on you when he brought me <laughs> to you. But uh, – <laughs> But he's done me a I'm solid. I'm glad that you deal with me. So. Uh, hmm. Any hobbies or interests outside of amps and – Related, etc. Guitars, uh, definitely cigars. Cool, that's absolutely. Right. Um, I don't even know why I love them so much. I just do. Um, you know, why I like them. I have a hard time like taking time for myself to do nothing. Ooh, and when I smoke a cigar, y- you know. Like, even if I walk the dog, okay, it's like 15 minutes, but I'll often come back and then I'll sit out back, maybe another five or, you know, if I've got a lot of stuff going on. But when I have freedom, which isn't a lot because I'm, you know, busy like everybody else. Um, right. It, if I want to enjoy a cigar, I, I have to sit for an hour minimum. Yeah. So that's why I like it. It's forced, it forces me to, you know, read a book, read a magazine, you know, catch up on, you know, talk to my wife for an hour. The only reason I don't smoke more is quite honestly, it's been so gross here. Heat wise. It has been fucking disgusting here for like, you know, since April, I can't wait till the heat breaks. Cause I'm dying to do that. To go out back. Cause you know, Anne's like, come on, let's go out on a Sunday morning. I'm like, Oh babe, it's gross. So, mm. uh, that's why I like cigars. That's well, you know, you've, you've, articulated that better than i could have that's that's the fact that you've got to take a puff and then let the tobacco rest yeah and you know in between puffs it's It's, like that right there for somebody with like terrible add and compulsions and all that kind of stuff it's sort of like that (laughs) it it forces you to like get it together yeah i'm not like add i'm just very like intense although i'm a lot I've mellowed so much like it's I almost don't even think I'm intense but my wife says no you're still intense but uh, you know so I'm just not one to sit and rest I don't I like to keep mentally busy and that's I can sort of give myself a permission slip to do that when I'm having a cigar yeah I'm the same way yeah I I just I just love it I love the uh I love the smell and the taste and all of that kind of stuff and just the I, it really forces you to me the like uh, not to get too weird or whatever, and people are probably going to shut it off now. But Jeff, you're past uh, you're, you passed that point like 45 minutes ago. Go ahead, let it rip. <laughs> the <laughs> way let to, it rip. <laughs> everybody, you know, there's so many unhappy people, and it's like living in the moment yes. to me is like the key to being happy mm. and. You know, that's what meditation is all about and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. And so to me, that's that's really the the key to life is just being in the moment. And cigars force you to do that. And it's great. Do you meditate? Oh, absolutely. And you're absolutely. still this fucking wound up. Wow. Yes. Yes. Uh, really? How long do you meditate for? Uh, it depends. Um I'd like to say that I get up at 5 a.m. and I make a whole thing of it and all that, but I'm just not that good. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's pretty. It's I, hard to do that. Yeah, if if I've got time, I'll do 20 minutes. Wow, that's can. really good. Well, you gotta you gotta work up to it. Yeah, but you it's, gotta practice it's it. very good. Holy shit, I do like 90 seconds and I'm good. 
<laughs> well, that, see, the more if you do it every day, you get really. I used to be like, oh my god, there's no way I'm going to be able to do five minutes. And um, now they make it so easy because you can just do it on your phone. Yeah. But um, yeah, the uh, ten minutes is like. I mean, I can do that with you know no problem. That's really but, good. That's awesome. Yeah, but I have to say that has been. If you want to say uh, my superpower, that has really changed me as a person all the way around. In in as far as like being able to live in the moment more and and just appreciate what's going on around you. Absolutely, yeah. and you know, back in the you know starting a business is. It's very scary. Hmm. And, um, you know, it's – your circumstances don't affect you as much. It's sort of like – I remember I used to – you know, it's like, oh, this guy's coming over and he's going to give me a hard time and it's going to take me forever to get his amp set up right and all that kind of stuff. And now – after doing all of this stuff, it's like I enjoy the challenge. I'm like, all right, I know this guy's not going to be happy, but you know what? I'm going to learn something, and I'm going to take my time, and I'm going to be patient with it. And it really, I mean, it just makes me a better person all the way around. Sure, sure. I and so it. it's uh, it's really good, and it's uh, it's it's a thing. It's, And I used to be like – I can't sit there for five minutes. There's just no way. I, sure. it, you'd have to hold a gun to my head. And then even still, I couldn't do it. But the more you practice it, the better you get yeah. at it. And oh, it is just... For sure. I think it makes me a better musician. Definitely makes me a better technician. And um, it makes me a better person. So. No, I totally get that. What, it, what it's done for me, not just meditating, but just I've really made a concerted effort. What it's done for me is it's taken a lot of stress that was... Like, I don't know, a few years ago, I just sort of realized, I said, you know, I guess because I turned 50 and I'm like, man, I, I just sort of realized a lot of the stress or a portion of the stress was my my stuff, you right. know, like worrying or not worrying, but just like not being in the present thinking about okay what's going to happen at that meeting next week or man I fucked this up last week but now I'm just like you know like yeah. if, if someone says my wife or kids you know oh what if that happens I'm like I don't know let's deal with it if that happens and it's like not to sound like an asshole and I don't I don't like dismiss them but I just say you know that might happen but let's you know that's not something we need to deal with now you know yeah. and that has really removed a lot of stress from my life and i'm really happy about that yeah because it's just the stress is just not worth it and it just no. eats you up inside and most I of the to... shit doesn't happen right exactly <laughs> exactly and that whole living in the past it's like man no. i don't want to do any of that stuff i used to i would tell people i'm like you remember the movie the fly with jeff goldblum yeah that's a long you time you remember how he would like he could vomit on somebody and melt them <laughs> i was like that with my stomach acid oh i would my get God. so like uh and i used to think that was the way that you dealt with business too it was just like mm -hmm. okay we're gonna go in there and we're just gonna i'm gonna stress it out and i'm gonna you know all nighters and all this kind of stuff and it doesn't do any good mm -hmm. it just doesn't mm -hmm. and um I mean, I was one of the first people to take Privacid, which is a, what is that? You know, it's a um, anti uh, oh stomach like acid stomach yeah stomach yeah stuff. yeah yeah okay. I was like one of the first people to ever take that stuff because they were just like you're you're wound up in knots. Oh wow! And, uh, so you, so it's really stuff. helped you anxiety wise. Oh God, yes. That's great. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, and I don't know that I had a lot of anxieties. I was just such a. I was just so intense with everything, yeah. and um, it just doesn't do any good. It's just way better to, uh, you know, just live in the moment, be you, be you, um, and just do, you know, just letting go of all that just weirdness. Yeah. It just, it's so much better. And you know, while you're here on Earth, it's better to be that way. I think, and yeah. so, well, the but I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to uh, turn off any listeners, but man, I got to tell you, just five minutes of meditating every day just sort of puts everything into focus, and I am more creative. Well, here's the good news, too. I've got like probably, I don't know, 15 years on you at least, but as you get older, that'll be even more easier to like just let shit go. Yeah, that's you what know? people tell me. Oh, totally, man. Because to some extent, you're like, 
it's just you just you're much more comfortable like thinking you know as long as your thoughts are like not you know they're good thoughts you're okay with that you know if if somebody's not okay with you that's fine it's totally cool you know yeah but I, I oh yeah but i'm certainly I not going to get up so personally yeah and now right. i'm just like it's not my business what people think of me right it's, it's really not right and yeah. so i let them i people tear me apart online and um, really yeah they they, they do <laughs> you're always like you know really nice online what are they gonna well, do? I, I I try to be, but uh, it's not. It's it's okay that they do that. I I feel like it's it's just not my business. No, it's not and so, right. And when you, it's so much. And so, yeah, like right, your shit is your shit. That's okay, but it's not mine. Right. You know? And so you know, if somebody doesn't see it my way, I try to just be completely open with them, and you know. If they're unhappy, I want to be open to hearing them out hmm. and. Being angry and just being like, well, you're full of shit. and I, That's wrong. That's just – you're never going to get anywhere with somebody. Yeah. So yeah. that's no, the way absolutely. I feel about it. But So I'm just all filled with bliss and uh, good time all the time. <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with that, man. <laughs> hey, two more questions. What's the best sure. advice you've ever been given and who gave it to you, if you could remember that? Uh, I want this on my gravestone. Uh, and this sounds very smart assy, but I don't mean it to be, uh, everyone has advice. No one has answers. That is the best thing I've ever heard. Everyone has advice. No one has answers. Yes. That to me is, I want this on my grave. I want my stepchildren to, to always know that, that everybody, it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're in business if you're fixing amps or whatever, everybody is going to tell you what you should do. And, um, I mean, my, lots of people, they don't understand, you know, amps. And so they're like, well, you shouldn't be doing that. You should go do this, that, and the other. And, um, everybody has advice, but they don't ever have an answer for what you should do. And so you just got to blaze the trail and just say, eh, to hell with what they say. Don't take the advice. Do the opposite. Uh, like yeah. George Costanza. Uh, <laughs> I think it was George Costanza on Seinfeld. He was like, I'm going to do the opposite of what I think I should do. And, um, man, that, that's totally true. <laughs> so There was a guy years ago. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of this company called Nightingale Conant. They make self-help stuff. No. Anyway, mm-hmm. Earl Nightingale was one of the founders, and he made um, a series of self uh, self-development stuff guy was like really the deepest voice like he he would talk and you're like holy shit like i better listen because this is you know i'm 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 gonna i'm gonna i'm bad if i don't you know he had just had that kind of voice but anyway he right. always said something that like you know the one way to make sure you're doing something right is if you're not doing what everybody else is doing something to that effect you know and yeah. I, i've always kind of admired that and try to you know, not do that for uh, to to be contrary, but be, you know because that's probably right. You know, most of the time. I well, to your point, the guy that I worked for that taught me how to fix amps, he would. He's an excellent guitar player, great, and one of the few natural musicians that I've ever met. And uh, he would set, he would play the amp and he would set it up and he made it sound great, but he would put it in somebody else's hands and it wasn't so great. It was actually pretty bad. And so just learning that, that it's not your amp, it's somebody else's amp. You got to get them in there and they got to play it and you set it up for them. Just that right there, that little like, you know, let go of your ego. You may be a better guitar player than this guy. It doesn't matter. It's not your aunt. Yeah, yeah. Just doing that right there, people will dump him any day and come to me because I give them what they want. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, you know, there's stuff like that that, you know, it, it's, you just got to, Ego is the Total Enemy. That's a great book, by the way. Ego is the Enemy. Everybody should read that book. Oh, it is, but, it's uh, a real book? Oh, yeah. Who yeah. wrote that? And. Oh, I can't remember his name. Uh, I knew you were going to ask me that. Um, no, I can't remember no his name. 
but it is it's an excellent book and it's basically like you've just got to let go of your ego you can't you know i have time this is just not the business where you have an ego because i can fix somebody's amp hand it back to them and and uh something could pop break or whatever and so you just got to go i'm sorry and take it back and fix it for them sure Sure. So this is just not that I know guys that play on records, they play chords and go, yeah, I made that record. I'm the greatest. And uh, that that's that's them. This you cannot do that. You need to let go of your ego. Sure. And the, the minute you do that, everything gets better. It just does. So uh, so read that book, though. It is excellent. ego is your enemy. Last yes. question. Mm -hmm. And you may have answered it. What's your definition of happiness? Living in the moment. Definitely. Being in the moment. I mean, how long did you say you'd been married? I've been with my wife 25 years. And looking back on that, do you think, and I don't want to reduce that down to too much. No, but no. Don't, it's fine. don't you think that like the best times that you had with your wife were times where you were totally present with her? I mean, if you if you think about it, I don't know. I'm asking. I, I have a very unusual relationship that... Um, she, I mean, I could be wrong here, but I no, no. Think. I have a very unusual relationship with my wife that, and she's not listening to this, nor will she ever listen to this. So I'm not saying it to. Oh, uh, you can you can call her bad names now. Oh no, no, the, the opposite. <laughs> there, she, there's something about her that. Um. And let me see if I can articulate it. There's something that she, it's not like a magic power, but there's something about, something I'm, I'm attracted to in her that with rare exception, I've always been like that with her. It's almost like childlike. It's very weird. And I consider myself very lucky because I enjoy that. And Interesting. I, yeah. it's And I'm like, you know, you... If you uh, if people meet me and then they hear me saying that because like I'm you know I I'm in really good shape I go to the gym I look like some bodybuilder dude and and like you know that's not a thing you'd expect me to say and you know I'm 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 just being honest there's something about this and I think that's why it's worked that I'm I, I don't know it's like we're still dating a month that's great that's the that's weird really cool yeah and I'm so lucky. That I and maybe I'm an idiot and I'm dreaming, but I don't feel that way. I feel like, you know, that same way that mm -hmm. uh, I don't. It, yeah, it just feels like it's been magic for 25 years. I, I don't, I don't know any other way to say it. Um, it's interesting. Weird. I'm just really lucky. Mm -hmm. The I, with me and my girl, I, I feel the same way about my girlfriend, but I always feel like there's really much more instead of like whenever I see her, it's like, okay, we got to, we got to, you know, walk the dog or whatever. It's sort of like the best times that I have with her are times whenever I'm present and I'm in the moment and I'm enjoying her company and hmm. things like that. And I'm not thinking about all the stuff I got to get done and all this kind of stuff. That to me, if you can share that with a person, it's like, those yeah. are just the happiest moments. Yeah, sure. And it's like that with everything. I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm very, very lucky. Um, yeah, being, it sounds though, like you have a good level of awareness of that being present. How, yeah. You know, and it's, good. it's important. It's really important to have that, I think, in, in life. It's just like, you know, the, make every moment count. Oh, I agree. And so, and let me but, just qualify my statement. It's not like we don't ever argue or we're never like I'm never oh, upset with her <laughs> or she's not upset with me. I just that like, you know, the lion's share of the time when we're not and and 90 percent of our arguments has been about children. So it's right, not even, yeah. it, you know, maybe 5 percent to do with us and 5 percent with some other bullshit. But uh so I don't want to make it seem like, oh, wow, I live in this fantasy world because I certainly don't. We fight just like everybody else. And, but sure, I, I, yeah. I've just been real lucky. I don't know. I always, I had a very uh, like troubled childhood and I always feel like, I don't know, this is maybe my wacky stuff, but I always feel like the universe gave me my wife and they said, okay, karmically, we're going to bring you back to level playing field by 
bringing this relationship into your life. And, and they've actually, and it's been way above, you know, as, as shitty as it was when I was a kid, it's been 10 times better than that. I mean, I'd go over that. I would do that 10 times worse because the reward, and I don't know if Anne was a reward to me or not. That's my own sort of wacky rationalization. It's just been, you know, it's like my lucky thing, I guess. I don't know. Everybody gets lucky with something. Right. So, yeah. You know, yeah. I didn't get lucky with good looks, so maybe I got lucky with my. <laughs> <laughs> the, it. It. Um. I. I totally agree with you, though. It is really because just being a kid and being so like, look at this, look at that. Blah, 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 the as bad as I was, as far as I just felt like nothing ever satisfied me, and um, my girlfriend sort of like just kind of makes that right, That's if that good, makes man. sense. Yeah, I totally. And agree. then. And uh, uh, quite honestly, I keep going back to it, but like meditation really simmers down what they call the monkey brain. Yeah, for sure. And um, have you read that Dan just, Harris book? Not yet. I want to. It's, it's on my list. It's pretty good, man. It's real. It's a real easy read. It was really interesting. Yeah, and that's what got me into it because he took away the the woo woo that has that that's typically in in our you know at least you know me more than you and my growing up that was always that woo woo I think nowadays nobody really associates that with meditation but you know right the introduction of meditation to you know my the baby boomers was like you know the uh the the Hare Krishna is handing out shit in subways at least in New right, York City yeah. you know and you're like oh no thank you you know um yeah so it took away a lot of that for me which is I was really grateful to read that so yeah I I call myself a secular Buddhist there you go. Because I just I I don't get into the rituals and all that kind of stuff, but the the I got I mean it just makes everything better. It really and does. So, and, and that's that's and good for me. And we'll be teaching meditation shops on Thursdays from two. That's to four. right. <laughs> yeah, hey, I man. don't have a calming enough voice to uh, even try to sell that to anybody. <laughs> hey man, I cannot thank you enough. Uh, what can uh, what do, what do you have? What can how can people find you online? What would you like to promote? Um, you're a great guy and you do really good work. And, well, uh, you're not around me all the time, so no. But um, I've heard, I've heard uh, through <laughs> the grapevine. Uh no, uh, I, I have heard can, that actually. You can find me on Facebook. Um, I love Instagram. I love it more than I should. What's I'm your Instagram? Like Twelve What's year old girl with that. What's your Instagram? Um, it's Heim Amps. Great Instagram Heim um, Amps. Yes, and um, y- you know, y- and you can also you can email me at Jeff at HeimAmplification dot com, and um, uh, you know, uh, there's. Your website, now with social is, media. your website is HeimAmplification.com? That's true, yeah. And it is still a little under construction because I am I keep changing things on it because that's my brain. Some of it is under construction, but it's a pretty good website, though. Yeah, it's like, Excuse me. It's actually got pretty good stuff on there. It's like, you know, yeah, the, it flows well. Aesthetically, it. it's fine. Yeah, the guy that helped me with it, he's a really talented dude. I and I, but I just keep giving him. I I wear him out, and uh, it's not uh, his fault. It's my he fault. needs to meditate to deal with you. Yeah, well, yeah. After hanging with me, uh, of course uh, he does. <laughs> all right, but, so uh, hi, ma'am. Yeah, on you can Instagram. Find me on Facebook or email me or whatever. And um, and if you're in town in Nashville, bring in your amp and have Jeff make a mod and. Make a man out of your – what is it? How Mac made a man out of your amp, right? There you go. Add? And definitely do not forget your credit card. Yes. That's also very important. Bring your credit um, card. There's no yeah. repair that's too small as long as you have your credit card with you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate everything. You're a great guy. I'm glad I got to know you better. Check out This is fun. Yeah, man, I'm glad. It was fun for me too. Check out Jeff on Instagram, Hi, I'm Amps. Or go to his website, Heim Amplification, or just if you want to send him an email, jeff at heimamplification.com. Thanks again, man. I appreciate it. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview. I really enjoyed uh, getting to know Jeff. Hope you did as well. Thanks again to Jeff Heim for spending his time with us. And go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get notified about future episodes along with some other cool new things we'll be doing for guitar players. Now, be nice. Go play your guitar and have some fun. And go meditate. Until next time, I'm out. Peace, everybody. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, 
please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. Thank you.